Maura Murray disappeared on Monday, February 9, 2004. When a person disappears without a trace, the most critical information is often hidden in their actions and words from the days before they vanished. Maura Murray's last known whereabouts may hold the clues to what happened to her. Our Mara is gone. It was like a nightmare. Maura Murray was born on May 4, 1982, in Brockton, Massachusetts, and was the youngest daughter of Fred Murray, a medical technician, and Lori Murray, a nurse. Maura grew up in Hanson, a small suburb on the south shore of Massachusetts, in a working-class family with plenty of guidance from her siblings, including her older brother Fred, sisters Kathleen and Julie, and younger brother Curtis. Her parents divorced when she was six. Mora was an overachiever who excelled both academically and athletically. At the same time, she was active in her local community, where she became known for her kind heart, signature dimples, and beautiful smile. She participated in nearly every sport, including competitive basketball, which allowed her to travel all over New England as a teenager. A fierce competitor, she consistently finished in the top tier of runners in the state of Massachusetts and broke several long-standing school records. Selected as a Boston Globe All-Scholastic in cross-country, Mora qualified for the U.S. National Scholastic Outdoor Championships in the Two Mile as a sophomore in 1998 finishing 33rd in the country. She graduated at the top of her class at Whitman Hanson Regional High School and had her pick of colleges, both academically and athletically. During her second year at West Point, Mora decided the military was not for her. She transferred to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where she decided to pursue a career in nursing. In November 2003, three months before her disappearance, Murray admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from several restaurants, including one in Hadley, Massachusetts. The charge was continued in December to be dismissed after three months of good behavior. On the evening of February 5, 2004, while she was on duty at her campus security job, Mora spoke on the phone with her older sister, Kathleen. They discussed Kathleen's relationship problems with her fiancé. Around 10.30 p.m., while still on her shift, Mora reportedly broke down in tears. When her supervisor arrived at her desk, Mora was just completely zoned out. No reaction at all. She was unresponsive. The supervisor escorted Mora back to her dorm room around 1.20 a.m. When asked what was wrong, Mora said two words. My sister. The contents of this call remained unknown until October 2017, when Kathleen publicly explained the conversation. Kathleen, a recovering alcoholic, had been discharged from a rehabilitation clinic that evening, and on the way home, her fiancé took her to a liquor store, which caused an emotional breakdown. On Saturday, February 7th, Murray's father Fred arrived in Amherst. He told investigators he and Mora went car shopping that afternoon and later went to dinner with a friend of his daughter. Mora dropped her father off at his motel room and, borrowing his Toyota Corolla, returned to campus to attend a dorm party. She arrived at 10.30 p.m. at 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, February 8th. She left the party. At 3.30 a.m., en route to her father's motel, she struck a guardrail on Route 9 in Hadley, causing nearly $10,000 worth of damage to her father's car. The responding officer wrote an accident report, but there is no documentation of field sobriety tests being conducted. Mora was driven to her father's motel and stayed in his room the rest of the morning. Later Sunday morning, Fred Murray learned his auto insurance would cover the damage to his vehicle. He rented a car, dropped Murray off at the university, and departed for Connecticut. At 11.30 that night, Fred called his daughter to remind her to obtain accident forms from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. They agreed to talk again Monday night to discuss the forms and fill out the insurance claim via phone. After midnight on Monday, February 9th, Mora used her personal computer to search MapQuest for directions to the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. The first reported contact Mora had with anyone on February 9th 
was at 1 alt p.m. when she emailed her boyfriend. I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking too much about anyone. I promised to call today, though. Love you, Mora. She also made a phone call inquiring about renting AA, privately held residential apartment at the same Bartlett, New Hampshire. Telephone records indicate the call lasted three minutes. The owner did not rent the condo to Mora. At 1.13 p.m., Mora called a fellow nursing student for reasons unknown. On the afternoon of Monday, February 9th, at 1.24 p.m., Mora emailed a work supervisor of the nursing school faculty that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in her family. According to her family, the family had not experienced a death. She also said she would contact them when she returned. At 2.05 p.m., Mora called a number that provided recorded information about booking hotels in Stowe, Vermont. The call lasted approximately five minutes. At 2.18 p.m., she telephoned her boyfriend and left a voice message promising him they would talk later. This call ended after one minute. In her car, Mora packed clothing, toiletries, college textbooks, and other things. When her room was searched later, campus police discovered most of her belongings packed in boxes and the art removed from the walls. It is not clear whether Mora packed them that day, but police at the time said she had packed between Sunday night and Monday morning. On top of the boxes was a printed email to Mora's boyfriend indicating trouble in their relationship. Around 3.30 p.m., she drove off the campus in her black 1996 Saturn sedan. Classes at the university had been canceled that day due to a snowstorm. At 3.40 p.m., Murray withdrew $280 from an ATM. Closed-circuit footage showed she was alone. At a nearby liquor store, Mora purchased about $40 worth of alcoholic beverages. Security footage again shows she was alone when she made that purchase. At some point in the day, she also picked up accident report forms from the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Mora then left Amherst between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., presumably via Interstate 91 North. She called to check her voicemail at 4.37 p.m., the last recorded use of her cell phone. To date, there is no indication she had informed anyone of her destination or any evidence that she had chosen one. Sometime after 7 p.m., a Woodsville, New Hampshire, resident heard a loud thump outside her house. Through her window, she could see a car up against the snowbank along Route 112, also known as Wild Aminouzik Road. The car pointed west on the eastbound side of the road. At 7.27 p.m., the local woman reported the car accident on the sharp corner of Route 112 adjacent to her home. She telephoned the Grafton County Sheriff's Department at 7.27 p.m. to report the accident. According to the 911 log, the woman claimed to have seen a man smoking a cigarette inside the car. However, she later stated that she had not seen a man nor a person smoking a cigarette, but rather had seen what appeared to be a red light glowing from inside the car, potentially from a cell phone. A passing motorist, a school bus driver who lived nearby, stopped at the scene. They saw the car, as well as a young woman walking around the vehicle. The school bus driver noticed the young woman was not bleeding or visibly injured, but cold and shivering. He offered to call for help. She asked him not to call the police and assured him she had already called AAA. AAA has no record of any such call. I just asked her how she was. She said she was shaken up. I couldn't see any blood on her face. And she was uh, shaking like this. I says, uh, okay, I'm gonna go call the police. Knowing there was no cellular reception in the area, the bus driver continued home and called the police. His call was received by the sheriff's department at 7.43 p.m. Another local resident driving home from work claims she passed by the scene around 7.37 p.m. and saw a police SUV parked face to face with Mora's car. She pulled over briefly, did not see anyone inside or outside the cars, and decided to continue home. This witness's statement contradicts the official police log, which has Haverhill police arriving nine minutes later. 
According to the official police log, at 7.46 p.m., a Haverhill police officer arrived at the scene, but the woman driver had disappeared. No one was inside or around the car. The car had impacted the tree on the driver's side of the vehicle, severely damaging the left headlight and pushing the car's radiator into the fan, rendering it inoperable. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side and both airbags had deployed. The car was locked. Inside and outside the car, he discovered red stains that looked to be red wine. Inside the car, the officer found an empty beer bottle and a damaged box of Franzia wine on the rear seat. In addition, he found a AAA card issued to Murray, blank accident report forms, gloves, compact discs, makeup, and diamond jewelry, driving directions to Burlington, Vermont, Mora's favorite stuffed animal, and a book about mountain climbing in the White Mountains. But something is missing, which were Mora's debit card, credit cards, and cell phone, none of which has been located or used since her disappearance. The police later reported some of the bottles of purchased liquor were also missing. Journalist Joe McGee summarized the incident. At a hairpin turn, she went off the road. Her car hit a tree. At that point, a person came along who was driving a bus. It was a neighbor. He asked her if she needed help. She refused. About 10 minutes later, police showed up at the scene and Maura Murray was gone. How strange it was. Police traced the vehicle to Mora and initially treated her as a missing person on the belief that she may have wanted to disappear voluntarily. This speculation was based on her travel preparations and no obvious evidence of foul play. In 2009, Murray's case was given to the New Hampshire Cold Case Division and authorities are handling it as a suspicious missing person case. Between 8 and 8.30 p.m., a contractor returning home from Franconia saw a young person moving quickly on foot eastbound on Route 112, about four to five miles east of where Murray's vehicle was discovered. He noted that the young person was wearing jeans, a dark coat, and a light-colored hood. He did not report it to the police immediately due to his own confusion of dates, only discovering three months later, when reviewing his work records, that he had spotted the young person the same night Mora disappeared. The responding officer and the bus driver drove around the area searching for Mora. Just before 80 p.m., EMS and a fire truck arrived to clear the scene. By 8.49 p.m., the car had been towed to a local garage. At about 9.30 p.m., the responding officer left. A rag believed to have been part of Mora's emergency roadside kit was discovered stuffed into Saturn's muffler pipe. Authorities would refer to Mora as simply missing. At 12.36 p.m. the following day, February 10th, a report for Mora was issued. She was reported as wearing a dark coat, jeans, and a black backpack. A voicemail was left on Fred Murray's home answering machine at 3.20 p.m. stating that her car had been found abandoned. He was working out of state and did not receive this call. At 5.00 p.m., Mara's older sister contacted her father to tell him of the situation. He then contacted the Haverhill Police Department and was told that, if Mara was not reported safe by the following morning, the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department would start a search. At 5.17 p.m., Murray was first referred to as missing by the Haverhill Police. On February 11th, Murray's father arrived before dawn in Haverhill. A police dog tracked the scent from one of Mara's gloves 100 yards, east of where the vehicle had been discovered, but lost the scent. This suggested to police she'd left the area in another car. Maura's boyfriend and his parents arrived in Haverhill. He was interrogated in private and then was joined by his parents for questioning. The police said they believed Murray came to the area either to run away or attempt suicide. Her family believed this was unlikely. Mora's boyfriend had turned off his cell phone during his flight to Haverhill. At some point, he received a voicemail that he believed was the sound of Mora sobbing. The call was traced to a calling card issued to the American Red Cross. On February 12th, Mora's father and her boyfriend held an evening press conference in Bethlehem, New Hampshire, 
and the next day, the first press coverage was published. The police reported Mora might be headed to the Kankamagas Highway area, and she was listed as endangered and possibly suicidal. The police report also stated Mora was intoxicated at the crash site, although the bus driver had said she did not appear impaired. A week after Mora's disappearance, her father and boyfriend were interviewed. Mora's family expanded their search into Vermont, dismayed that authorities there had not been informed of her disappearance. Although missing person cases are normally handled by local and state police, the FBI joined the investigation 10 days after she disappeared. The FBI interviewed a family from Massachusetts, and the Haverhill police chief announced that the search was now nationwide. Ten days after her disappearance, New Hampshire Fish and Game conducted a second ground and air search using a helicopter with a thermal imaging camera, tracking dogs, and cadaver dogs. Mora's older sister discovered a ripped white pair of women's underwear lying in the snow on a secluded trail near French Pond Road on February 26, but DNA tests found that the underwear did not belong to Murray. The disturbing theories about what may have happened to her. One of the earliest police theories about this befuddling missing person case was that Maura Murray had either planned to kill herself or had been consumed by suicidal thoughts after her final car accident. But many of her loved ones have firmly insisted that she would never have ended her own life, even with all the incidents that had happened in the preceding days. Personal feelings aside, some of the items that Mora had packed in her car, such as tooth whitener and college textbooks, have led many to believe that she was not intending to die that day. After all, why would a suicidal person bother packing items like those? Another theory was that Murray had simply panicked after crashing her car just hours after damaging her father's vehicle and had escaped the area to avoid getting into trouble. Considering the amount of alcohol found at the scene and the Coke bottle that was likely filled with alcohol, authorities believed that Mora had been drinking and didn't want to risk jeopardizing her record of good behavior after her credit card fraud arrest. The nearby woods might have hypothetically been a good place to hide out if the weather had been warm, but it was rather cold outside, and there were no footprints found in the snow leading to the woods, meaning that she would have had to escape on the road, likely moving east of the accident scene, since that area was not inspected during the first search. Interestingly enough, a contractor who had been passing by on Route 112 that night later reported seeing a young person moving eastbound on foot a few miles away from the scene of the accident around 8 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. However, the contractor didn't report the alleged sighting until months later because he was unsure at first about the exact date he had seen the person. It's still unclear whether that person was actually Mora. Assuming that Mora did not kill herself and did not succumb to the elements while in hiding, where would she have gone? Some have speculated that she started a new life for herself, perhaps even in Canada, to escape her legal issues and the drama that was unfolding in her personal life. While authorities have acknowledged the possibility that Mora is still out there somewhere, they think it's extremely unlikely. Though some have stuck to the suicide or accidental death theories, others think that she was abducted. Her father Fred firmly believes that she was taken by a local dirtbag. However, many residents of Haverhill have scoffed at the idea that it was a local person who did it, and suggest that Mora was simply at the wrong place at the wrong time, and that a random kidnapper just happened to be on that road on that day. Other theories have focused on Atwood, a bus conductor, the last known person to see Mora alive. Some found it suspicious that he did not stay with Mora until help arrived. Also, he and his wife moved to Florida shortly after the disappearance. Perhaps most shockingly, some citizen sleuths have implied that Mora's father may have been abusive toward her, perhaps prompting her to run away, an accusation that Mora's loved ones have denied. But for all the theories, we're no closer to finding out what happened to Maura Murray today than we were nearly two decades ago. Considering her slim chances of survival, there have been multiple efforts to recover her remains near the scene of the accident. 
but these have all led to dead ends. On July 1st, 2005, police retrieved the items found in Mora's vehicle from her family for forensic analysis. On July 13th, a one-mile radius search was performed by nearly 100 searchers, including state troopers, rescue personnel, and volunteers. It was the fourth search around the crash area and the first search performed without snow on the ground. Authorities were most interested in locating the black backpack Mora had in her possession, but not found in her car. Police stated the search discovered nothing conclusive. In February 2019, the 15th anniversary of Mora's disappearance, Fred Murray reiterated his belief that his daughter was dead, as well as his suspicions about the nearby house that cadaver dogs responded to, stating, That's my daughter, I do believe. In early 2021, the tree at the site where Murray was last seen, which had been marked with a blue ribbon as a memorial, was cut down by the property owner. Shortly thereafter, a request from Murray's family to have a New Hampshire historical marker placed at the site, which had been submitted in late 2020, was turned down by the New Hampshire division. On September 14, 2021, New Hampshire State Police announced that bone fragments had been found on Loon Mountain in Lincoln, New Hampshire, approximately 25 miles east of the site of Mora's crash. Mora had been to the mountain before and had knowledge of the area, according to her sister. The bone fragments were described as pretty small, and it was expected to take at least two months to determine if they were the remains of Mara or not. In November, it was announced that the remains were not of Mara. In January 2022, the FBI issued a national alert in Mara's case and created a violent criminal apprehension profile allowing multiple law enforcement agencies to share information regarding her case.